starting point is uh, Kuki's uh, last uh, paper that appeared post mortem, uh, a very puzzling entry in the Encyclopedia, encyclopedia of. Uh, Okay, which dealt with two issues. It was an entry on multiple comparisons, but it dealt with two issues. FDR and pairwise comparisons, which is based on the paper that took here in France, and using random effects, analysis of variance, even if the effects are only variable and not random. And this was an extremely strange combination of topics and essentially, it took me a while working in behavioral genetics to understand that this paper was essentially about replicability. These were the two issues that took considered as important to get replicability of result. And this is addressing selective inference and the addressing the relevant variability. But also a point there was to be ready to compromise in practice. So selective inference, just a briefly I'll talk, is inference on selected subset of the parameters that turned out to be of interest after viewing the data. And it's relevant to all statistical methods, and it's hurting replicability. There is out-of-study selection, which is not evident in the published work, and it is uh, very well known uh, as a hurting issues, and it has all these wonderful names. Uh, and, uh, and terrible things that you can do with uh, the data. But my emphasis on in-study selection, which is evident in the published work, and still hurts replicability much. So evidence selection uh, can be done by selecting issues into the abstract, into the discussion, uh, putting things into a table, or even in a figure. This is an example from a study of Stein et al. Associations between volume changes in voxels with genotypes. There were 32,000 voxels searched for each, geno for each SNP, 450,000 SNPs, and altogether from the 13 billion, these were selected to be presented. So this is selection by a figure. It was simply the top five SNPs and then within the top five SNPs, what turned out to be significant. Uh, more common is highlighting those that pass a threshold, and the threshold is very often simply being statistical significant, be less than 0.05, 0.05. This is from a study I took yesterday from the wall. Uh, is the author here? <laughs> okay, so you have here um, the stars and the double stars and so on, and they are then selected and being discussed and uh, conclusions are being made. The point is I'm not criticizing it. In complex research problems, in-study selection is unavoidable. Not only that, it's desirable because who can take the entire set of results in a paper and make sense of it itself? Nobody will. So for that purpose, you have an abstract, you have a study. Most people read the title, and then if it's interesting enough, the abstract. But the point is that after you do the selection, it has to be addressed. Now, the, the problem is that most of the selection in science was done using p-values. So when replicability problems started to surface, uh, the attack was on the p-value. And uh, I will tell you now the politics behind the attack, the response of the statistical community to the attack on the p-value in four acts. Act one, American Statistical Association, ASA, a broad statement about p-values, and I'm sure you all know, or most of you know about it, p-values do not represent the probability that the analysis process is, is pulled. P-values provide no information, people provide no information, p-value don't, p-value don't, p-value don't. Everything is on the p-value and not about other things, not about confidence interval, not, ba not about Bayesian um, odds and so on and so forth. And the statement concluded in view of the relevant misuses and misconception concerning p-value, some statisticians prefer to supplement or even replace the p-values with other approaches such as confidence interval, Bayesian status and so on and so forth. 
Now, behind the scene, I was a member of the, of the team that uh, was behind this, uh, and this was a total uh, disarray. We sat for two days, and no agreement was reached. It was overwhelmed by Bayesian thinkers, and at the end, uh, two people presented it. And if you look at the paper itself, there are 20 descending papers that were written about this claim, but they appear only on the website and not in the, in the journal. This was followed by a symposium on statistical inference titled Scientific Methods for the 21st Century, a World Beyond P less than 0.25. It was organized by uh, ASA in Wasserstein, one of the uh, writers of the previous one. It was titled Moving to a World Beyond P less than 0.25. So immediately the conclusion is there. And uh, there was a, a, they wrote an editorial don't use P less than 0.05, don't say statistically significant, don't use any bright line rule. Can you live with no bright line rule with all of the displays and the graphical displays that you're presenting when you have those active and non-active, uh, connected, non-connected? There's no way you can do science, uh, at least in, in your part of uh, science. What should you do? You should accept uncertainty, be thoughtful, open, and modest. That's very nice, and I hope you will do it, but you can't do science with this kind of recipes for statistical analysis. Unfortunately, it has been identified as part of the uh, as a, a second statement by the ASA because it's the same person who was involved in that. And so you can read the American Statistical Association has recently issued two statements about the p-value, less than 4.5, uh, uh, which was, uh, and they referred to Wasserstein and Lazar, the first one and the second one. The statements are mainly concerned with the abuse and misuse of the p-value. Now, this uh, concerned the president of ASA, Karen Kafferda, and she decided to have a task force statement on statistical significance. And once we convened, I was a member of that one, once we convened, it was agreed by all that there would be one page statement and that it would be agreed by all. I mean, no, no consensus, a consensus statement. It started in 2020 during the corona, it sped up, and uh, we presented it to the ASA board once. They asked for a vision. A second time, they rejected accepting it as a, a statement. Uh, for a statement, you need two-thirds, and there was a majority, and there was only simple majority. There was no rules, actually, but they allowed us to publish it. And I want to give you just a few sentences from this. Uh, it, it appears in the Annals of Applied uh, Statistics. First one, p-values are valid statistical measures that provide convenient conventions for communicating the uncertainty inherent in qualitative results. Indeed, p-values and significant tests are among the most studied and best understood statistical procedure in the statistic literature. They are important tools. They have advanced science through their proper application. For me, and I think for this community, it, they are indispensable, not only uh, important. Second issue, capturing the uncertainty associated with statistical summaries is critical. Different measures of uncertainty can complement one another but no single measure serves all purposes. So you cannot get rid of, say, the p-values and replace it by confidence interval. You need both p-values estimate standard errors, confidence interval. And if you go Bayesian, you also cannot use a single measure because uh, posterior odds are not enough. And finally, de dealing with replicability and uncertainty lies at the heart of statistical science. Selective reporting, even the highlighting of a few persuasive results among, this report, among those reported may lead to a distorted view of the evidence. In some settings, this problem may be mitigated by adjusting for multiplicity. Though the point is, adjust all statistical summaries for selection. Unfortunately, adjusting for confidence interval is rarely done including the most in the best journals. So you, we look at New England Journal of Medicine. They have new guidelines for statistical reporting in the journal. 
p-values may not be reported for secondary endpoints if multiplicity correction method was not specified in the protocol in the statistical analysis. What should you do then? Unadjusted marginal 95% confidence interval for all secondary endpoints. Well, if you don't have to, then clearly you won't specify it in the protocol, right? Um, but the danger is, uh, and they give an example, and the example they give is uh, from a study by Manson et al., which appeared a year earlier in the New England Journal of Medicine about fish oil supplements that had no significant effect on the composite primary endpoint of cardiac heart disease, stroke, or death, but reduce the risk of, and they give the list of the 17 ones, and there are four where the confidence interval, as you can see, the confidence interval doesn't cover one, that is, they are better. Only four of the 17 secondary, and these were the one that were later also selected by a citing result that appeared also in a good uh, review in, in cardiology. So the danger is there. Last act on the politics in February 22, McNaughton compiled a list of 41 explicit reference to the Wasserstein 2019 uh, editorial as official ASA policy. Uh, the ex-president Kafadar just uh, burst, sent a letter to the AS board required. Either the board approves the editorial as its policy or a disclaimer is added to the paper and now you can find a disclaimer that this paper just describes what these three people wrote and not the ASA. But the danger is done. There are important advantages in addressing selective inference and that I will just mention the two but not get into it. Hierarchical methods attending to research problems that enjoy further structure. And this is the example that I showed before because there are seven groups of uh, inferences, families, and within each group, there are three that are compared with a uh, control. So you have one level of in what group there is a result and another level in what, in what uh, this is done. And you can see that here only five are being selected, so you have to attenuate, but it's a useful and uh, both uh, interpretable a study, and of course it can be done here where you have first the SNPs and then with, for each SNP you have the model. The second place, and there is a lot more that is going on with higher levels, you can go really deeply into the problems that you encounter. Uh, the second uh, is confidence interval that offer conditional coverage or coverage on the average of the selected conditional coverage. Uh, offers so you, you can combat the publication bias or exploratory research. You condition on what, why you chose this one. You chose it because it was less than 0.05. Just to, uh, using these hierarchical methods and visiting the reproducibility, the 100 reproducibility psychological research studies, we did an in study for each one of them. There are between five and 720 inferences in those 100 papers with an average of 72. I mean, huge number are hiding in each uh, paper. Um, in 22, uh, we got P adjusted bigger than 0.05, so we didn't count them. Uh, so we weeded them out. Out of this 22, 21 were non-replicable results and one was a replicable discovery that was lost. I will uh, I do want to mention the other issue in a, in a lot in a small, and this is the issue of the variability relevant variability. The point is that uh, the point is that as you can see, if these are the results across six laboratories oh sorry. These are, what you see are six uh, different results among six laboratories and the analysis done in each laboratory separately. And the lines are significant result in each lab in a laboratory and the voltage one are not significant. 
And you can see that sometimes they, are, they look replicable with no interaction, sometimes there is interaction, but they all look similar, but sometimes you have one result going here and the other one there, and it depends on the endpoint being measured in the trial. The trial was comparing two genotypes uh, of mice. And the point is that if you do a fixed analysis, if you do a fixed analysis, fixed ANOVA, you don't get everything is fine, but if you try to, uh, to look for replicability via the random lab model where you treat the labs as random, what you get is that this is significant, the second one is significant, and the last one win. So th what, we, uh, what we suggest is that, this is the last one, not one. <laughs> so what we suggest is to incorporate the interaction term that really inflates the standard deviation, even in the single laboratory. Where will this interaction come? It can come from a database where you can estimate the interaction in a multi lab experiment and use it, plug it into that. And this is what we did uh, over the last four years. It was a complicated experiment. We took 165 single lab experimental results involving comparisons between my strains from the mouse phenotyping database. We carried similar experiments in Jackson Laboratory uh, and the two here in Israel without much coordination. I mean, they weren't perfectly known. We used random lab mixed model analysis to assess the replicability of the original results, which was replicable, which was not. And we estimated the ratio of the interaction to the within lab uh, from different uh, sources and compared the original result with our results and just look at the, uh, the square on the right side where you can see, um, I'll try to point without making, these are the non-replicable results as identified from the tree. These are the replicable results. If you look at the original analysis, you have 60% of non-replicable results among the discovered. If you use this adjustment, you get 12 reduction to 12%. So a huge improvement in replicability if you take this into consideration. Well, um, if you try, just let's leave this one. Okay, so this is the point of that uh, study. Uh, the final points, we can only enhance the replicability of a single study. We cannot be sure that it's replicable until we test its replicability. Therefore, try to improve measures by reducing this factor, the interaction relative to the within study. Don't standardize too much. Heterogenize. Assess results by actual replication. And for this purpose, and this is something that is, will sound strange, many small studies are better than a single large one. Because for many small studies, we learn about the interaction. And it's the interaction that we cannot solve just by increasing the number of animals in our laboratory. So what I suggest is to make replication of small relevant studies part of your regular work and make these results available to all. Thank you. Thank you.